Good morning, everyone. It's Russell Pillimer from Pangana Capital. I'm the CEO of uh, Pangana, and I have with me here uh, Jonathan Herstritt, uh, who is a senior investment professional at Grosvenor Capital. Uh, what I'd uh, like to do today is to take uh, take you through uh, the, um, the the Pangana uh, Private Equity Trust. Um, I will um, give um, a background to uh, uh, to what we are doing in the private equity segment. Uh, talk about what is our ch chosen segment of private equity. Uh, address why private equity is indeed so popular for investors today and then talk about PE1, um, our private equity solution. Finally, uh, finish off and talk about the secondary offer. So let's begin by talking about um, uh, the private equity world. And this slide in front of you um, is really the essence uh, behind uh, the proposition that we are bringing to our investors. And this um, a slide shows the following. If you looked at the US market and the similar uh, situation exists in the European markets, uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there were about eight, uh, 25 years ago, there were about 8,000 listed companies in the, the US market. Today, there are less than 4,000 listed companies. The market is almost halved. Now, the market cap of the S&P um, has grown strongly, um, but that's because large companies um, have grown uh, into mega large companies and the mega companies have become trillion dollar companies. Uh, but the smaller end of the market has largely been been hollowed out. Um, and that's because it's become unattractive uh, for smaller companies to list. Um, listing and being a publicly listed company in the US uh, is, um, uh, is a big task. Uh, the costs involved are substantial, the legal costs, the compliance costs, uh, and then also the issue of quarterly reporting, uh, which is forced upon uh, publicly listed companies in the US. Um, is a it's a hard way to run a company, and so um, for these various uh, reasons, um, public markets, as I said, have become an, uh, unattractive to smaller companies in the U.S. And we, when we're talking about smaller companies, uh, we're actually talking uh, about companies of circa a billion dollars um, of market value, and sometimes even less than two billion dollars um, of market cap. Now, that's a strange concept for us in Australia to uh, get our heads around because uh, billion dollar companies in Australia are quite a significant part of our marketplace and would be considered to be relatively uh, large companies. But over there, that's the smaller end of the market and that's, that market um, uh, has become, uh, um, as I say, hollowed out. Now, um, those companies, um, because uh, they might not be listed, but they still have demands for capital. Uh, so uh, the reasons for that are that they uh, need to grow, uh, capital to grow, they might need to make acquisitions, they might have shareholders who need to sell out. So for all these various reasons, uh, they still do need to raise capital. Private equity um, uh, noticed this a number of years ago and stepped into this void and it's really through private equity that a lot of this capital um, is currently being uh, provided. Private equity in turn has sourced its capital from the large end of town, from the big institutional investors, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, insurance companies, mega family offices, et cetera. And uh, it's really those investors who've had, had access to these uh, smaller mid-sized companies, uh, whereas the direct retail and high net worth investors have effectively been shut out of these opportunities as they're no longer available uh, in the public markets. Let me move now to talk, talk about uh, private equity. What do we consider to be our chosen segment of the private equity market? Now, private equity is a big space and it can mean different things to different people. Um, venture capital um, is, some, is an activity um, that's uh, quite prevalent in the market and it gets a lot of press on this. Venture capital, as you probably know, is when you put money into a newly established uh, company. It's usually a technology related company and uh, your hope there is to make, um, uh, you know, maybe five or 10 times your money, but at the same time, you might lose your entire investment. Um, you know, that, that can prove to be a very good um, uh, investment opportunity in the venture capital space, but that's not what we're focused on. Um, uh, that's not our end of the market. Growth capital uh, is another area that's not particularly um, um, uh, our area of focus. And growth capital, in essence, you can think of as being a more mature private equity uh, style uh, uh, business. 
uh, but a business that's just got some um, some traction and is a, is a larger business, but essentially um, grew up as a private, it grew up as a venture capital type business. So um, an example of that might means it might uh, be something like an Uber, uh, where there's a large amounts of uh, revenues, but uh, uh, a lack of profitability, etc. And you buy into a, a growth capital type business. Uh, on the assumption that they probably still won't make money in a few years' time, but that they'll be much larger and somebody will be prepared to make uh, pay a much larger uh, price for them. Um, we then talk about um, traditional private equity. Uh, so traditional bi private equity, um, buying uh, companies that uh, generate cash flows, uh, these are mature, stable companies, um, and there's an opportunity to, um, uh, to improve them. Private equity uh, buys into these companies, private equity operators, or what they know uh, in the offshore market as private equity sponsors, um, are very adept at getting involved in such companies. They help companies uh, um, grow, they grow their cash flows, and um, they, um, several years down the track, uh, they exit them and hopefully at a substantially higher price um, and generate returns for investors. Um, there is a large end of this private equity market and there's a smaller end of the private equity market. The large end of the market um, is what we usually read about in the press. Um, seems like uh, not a week or even a day goes by in Australia without reading about some big private equity fund. And uh, these funds can be pretty large. They can be 20 or even $30 billion in size. The names we read about are the Blackstones and the KKRs and the Carlisles, et cetera. Um, that's not the end of the market that we're focused on. We're focused on the smaller uh, size managers or the medium sized managers. Um, our managers um, or sponsors uh, raise um, anywhere up to a couple of billion dollars or so per fund. And uh, these managers in turn will invest in companies worth anywhere from a couple of hundred million dollars to a couple of billion dollars. That's the sweet spot in the market and that's where our focus uh, um, is at. Uh, you recall in my first slide, I, I spoke about uh, the reduction uh, in number of listed companies in the US, and that's because smaller companies don't have an IPO alternative. Well, that's precisely the dynamic that we're see uh, seeking to take advantage of. And uh, the multiples uh, that are paid for smaller companies are substantially lower than the multiples that are paid for larger companies. Uh, in the marketplace because there is no RPO alternative. So you can imagine if you're a, one of these larger funds and you're buying a company that might be, have a market value of five or $10 billion, those companies can indeed undertake RPOs. And we know that multiples are very strong in the RPO market, um, uh, whereas the smaller companies do not have that opportunity. We therefore like the smaller end of the market. Uh, we prefer the smaller end of the market to the large end of the market because um, the um, entry points are lower and therefore it's possible uh, to make um, a better returns at that end of the market. Um, let's talk about um, why a private equity um, is, is so attractive. Uh, so this slide in front of you here looks at the returns in private equity markets in general, and this is based upon an index of private equity um, uh, firms worldwide, compiled by a group called Burgess, who are a independent um, a group who, who compile uh, these returns. You can see from this page that the returns in private equity, which is the dark blue bar, substantially um, exceed the returns in the listed equity markets, uh, which are the, um, yellow, um, uh, the, the yellow bars. And this is whether it's over a 10 year or even a 20 year period. You can see over 20 years, the returns have been substantially higher, but even over 10 years, when we've been subject to a strong bull market, private equity still has outperformed list listed equities. And this is the key reason uh, why uh, private equity um, is so keenly sought after. Now, private equity, because of these, um, because of these substantial returns um, uh, has, um, uh, it's, so it's it's not just the it's not just not just the returns that are so uh, significant in private equity um, that makes sense uh, to use it in portfolios, but it's also uh, the risk and um, uh, and lack of correlation that private equity has with listed equities. So the chart in front shows 
um, that private equity not only has high returns in listed equity markets, but also has lower volatility and low correlation with listed equities. If you take um, a, an asset with higher returns and lower volatility, and you incorporate that into a diversified, diversified portfolio, you can see that you substantially increase the returns of the portfolio whilst reducing the risk of the portfolio. And this chart in front shows that uh, if you took a portfolio which um, consisted of 60, 40 equity and bonds, so that would be considered to be quite a traditional portfolio, you uh, substituted 20% of private equity into that portfolio, uh, you can see that the returns uh, are significantly higher whilst at the same time risk is reduced. So it's quite a unique asset, private equity, to include to be included in these portfolios. So for these reasons, um, uh, the attractiveness of private equity, uh, private equity has really become increasingly popular um, in, in portfolios. If you look at the large end of uh, large end of town, the very sophisticated investors being the sovereign wealth funds and pension funds, mega family offices, etc., uh, they no longer consider private equity to be a fringe asset, uh, at fringe asset class, or even an alternative asset class uh, that um, you know might only get a couple of percent in portfolios. In fact, private equity has become, become so substantial that in many portfolios, it's as large or um, sometimes even larger than the listed equity components in portfolios. We can see that as a good example uh, in the Australian marketplace. Um, the Future Fund, um, which is um, you know, a highly sophisticated investor operating out of Australia, um, has 19% um, of their portfolio in global developed market listed equities um, and only 16% uh, and 16 in global private equity, only a little bit less. And the private equity part of that portfolio has almost doubled over the last five years. And that's pretty consistent with, um, with most of the big institutions uh, around the world, and in fact, potentially even uh, uh, at 16%, it's potentially even smaller than, uh, than, than the uh, comparables. So in looking at uh, uh, this investment option um, uh, at Pengana, we um, thought it would be a great idea to be able to bring this uh, to our uh, direct um, retail and high net worth investors in the Australian marketplace. Um, in uh, um, because of the attractive of both both of the returns and the um, and the, and the volatility and low correlation, um, we however face two um, uh, significant obstacles uh, in, in in creating a product for this market. The first obstacle was that of access. So um, I mentioned that uh, the funds that we favour are the smaller uh, or mid-sized private equity uh, uh, funds. Um, around one to two billion dollars uh, in size per fund. Uh, the problem with these funds is that if you've got a top quartile manager, so one of the better managers in that space or better sponsors in the space, uh, those managers are inundated with capital. They do not need new sources of capital. Uh, they'll come back to the market every three to five years and raise another fund. Um, and um, they have investors lined up to invest with them. Um, unless you have strong relationships with them, uh, you are uh, unable to gain access. This issue was even compounded for us um, at Pengana because we didn't just want to give investors access uh, to a small uh, a number of private equity funds. We wanted to give access to a large number of private equity uh, funds and private equity investment opportunities. Um, and um, so this issue of access became very critical. Um, we were luckily enough, uh, we were able to do a joint entry into a joint venture with Grosvenor Capital. Um, uh, Gr Grosvenor was our first prize in finding a joint venture partner. So the world of private equity investment um, allocations is essentially controlled by six dominant players globally and Grosvenor being one of them. The reason why Grosvenor was our first choice is because Grosvenor have a market leading position in investing in the smaller size funds in the US market. Those small to mid size funds uh, is where Grosvenor excels and um, uh, really is a, is a dominant force in that marketplace. Um, so through Grosvenor, we've been able to get access uh, to a wide array of uh, top performing, top quartile uh, private equity um, managers and investments. 
The second issue we had to cope with uh, was one of liquidity. Um, and um, liquidity is particularly significant uh, issue in the, um, uh, uh, in the retail and high net worth markets in that if you invest directly into a private equity fund, you need to be happy to have your money tied up for 10 or even 12 or 15 years. Private equity uh, investing is a long-term uh, proposition and you really don't uh, want to have to sell out in that interim period uh, because you're unlikely to get the right economics um, if you do. A private equity is an asset that you need to hold um, all the way uh, uh, to, uh, to the final stages until the assets are sold. Um, uh, for very large investors and especially investors which you have very long-term time frames, uh, such as a sovereign wealth fund, having a 10 or 15 year investment is not a problem. However, for most retail and high net worth investors, this is a huge impediment. They do not um, like the idea of having their money locked up for that period of time without any access. So we needed to solve that, that issue. Um, uh, we, um, if you um, have a fund that um, provides liquidity to investors, um, but at the same time, the underlying assets are highly illiquid, illiquid like they are in private equity land. Um, this will work fine as long as the inflows into the fund are more than the outflows from the fund. The moment that your outflows start exceeding your inflows it, to any significant extent, uh, the uh, problem will be caused and um, uh, redemptions would need to be gated. Now, Australian corporate history is littered with such examples um, uh, of liquidity mismatches where um, funds um, uh, are uh, ultimately uh, frozen. Uh, we've seen this in the uh, property space and the mortgage space, um, et cetera. Uh, the solution we arrived at um, is a solution where, um, uh, which is the solution that is used by the property trust industry and it has been used for many years. So property trust industry figured out that the way to deal with liquidity mismatches is to take your fund and to list it on the ASX. That way investors have liquidity by being able to sell their, uh, their units or shares on the market each and every day. Um, whilst at the same time, the, uh, the investment manager doesn't need to worry about holding cash in their portfolio to fund redemptions or alternatively selling assets to fund redemptions. So, um, so our structure looks almost identical to the structure of a listed property trust or a REIT. Um, whereby um, uh, we are a, we have taken the fund and we have listed it. Um, our underlying assets are private equity rather than uh, properties, but it's a similar type of asset. Both are long-term, uh, long-term assets. Um, we also have a yield in the portfolio. We have a four percent yield, um, and the four percent yield is paid on the uh, on the hopefully increasing capital amount in the fund. We're ultimately seeking a 4% yield plus very strong capital uh, growth uh, on top of that. And uh, Jonathan will give an indication of what uh, private equity returns can look, can look like in terms of capital growth. So it's a simple way to invest. Uh, you can get access to a very diversified portfolio of private equity um, uh, funds and investments uh, through uh, one single uh, listed uh, unit. So we took the uh, proposition uh, of the of PE1 to the marketplace um, uh, just uh, about 10 months ago. Um, we uh, raised um, just a bit north of $200 million uh, in the raising in the IPO. Uh, we had hoped to raise more at the time. Uh, we um, had been targeting um, north of 400 million. Um, I think the reasons why investors were reluctant um, or didn't invest as much as we hoped they would at the time were really uh, twofold. Number one, it was a new vehicle and investors were unsure of exactly what types of fund managers or assets would be put into the vehicle. Um, and until they uh, would see that, I think there was a level of, of um, a lack of comfort. Um, the second issue, which is probably the larger issue, was the issue about um, how would this trade and would our vehicle trade at a discount to net asset value. We um, predicted at the time we were of a strong view that we wouldn't trade at a discount to net asset value, but that we'd, we would actually trade at a premium to our net asset value. Um, uh, however, 
um, there was um, uh, a lot of uncertainty about this. And so I think a, a, a fair number of investors didn't enter into the vehicle because of that. Um, over the last uh, 10 months or so, we have been able to show, uh, uh, to address both these key issues. Number one, we've been able to show um, investors the types of deals that are going into the portfolio and the high quality uh, of these deals. And secondly, um, to also um, show that the vehicle uh, does trade at a premium and it has um, uh, almost, um, uh, from a couple of weeks after listing, um, it's almost always traded at a, a healthy premium to our net asset value, including, uh, including today where it does that. Um, so we've been able to address that issue um, because, uh, because investors um, are now satisfied with both these issues. We've found a strong amount of demand um, over the uh, past several months. And so we've decided to come back to the marketplace. Um, and we are, a, a, today we opened uh, uh, our secondary offer. The secondary offer uh, consists of an entitlement offer plus a discretionary offer. Uh, the entitlement offer is a two for one entitlement offer to existing unit holders. So for every one unit an existing unit holder holds, they will be able to acquire an, an additional uh, two units and the acquisition uh, or the price under the secondary offer uh, will be the net asset value um, of uh, $1.37 a share. Uh, which is a net asset value post a small distribution uh, that is that is coming up. Um, the um, uh, what is not uh, taken up in the entitlement offer, uh, we will be able to place in the in the discretionary offer, and we will be placing that both to uh, financial advisors with whom we have relationships for their clients, as well as to uh, direct clients of Pengana um, and our related um, and our related entities and funds. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Herstritt. Uh, Jonathan will talk about Grosvenor and the investment portfolio. Thanks, Russ. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. So I'll start with a little bit of a background on Grosvenor. We're having an audio issue. All right. Sorry about that. So Grosvenor Capital Management, we're based in Chicago. We have $57 billion um, on, of assets under management. We were founded in 1971 and we have almost 500 employees around the world. We have almost 160 investment professionals and um, we really specialize in creating customized uh, accounts for clients. And so what we did with partnering with Pangana was very similar to what we've done with many uh, large institutions, whether it's pension funds or sovereign wealth funds where we decided um, what we thought would be the best mix of private equity implementation styles and assets. And then we created a target portfolio, which we've been executing on since launch. Um, we've, on our private equity side, we have been investing for almost 20 years. We've made almost 800 investments in funds, companies, um, as well as secondary transactions. Um, and that is what we're executing on uh, for the trust. Um, every year we put billions of dollars to work in private equity and so the Pangana Trust uh, just falls into that um, pipe. So if you think of what we decided to do, so there's three main ways to implement private equity. There's primaries, which are, you would think of traditional funds. So as Ross mentioned on the high end, the more visible Blackstones and Carlisles. You then have co-investments, which are actually single deals that the primary fund managers make, but that um, because of different reasons, they're, they need extra capital or they don't want it to be too big of their fund. And so they'll come to people like Grosvenor who have capital waiting to be co-investors. This has become very popular in the institutional world because whereas primary third-party primary managers charge pretty full fees, um, Co-investments are usually done at uh, little to no fee. Um, we also then offer the trust uh, secondary transactions. So you can think of this as used primaries. So if you think of a primary, a primary fund manager typically takes three to five years to um, commit the capital into um, somewhere between 10 and 15 deals. Um, a secondary is that fund, but it's later in its life. So it's often seeded with those transactions and they might actually have very few deals left. 
Um, and there's different reasons why people want to enter into secondary transactions in the private market. Maybe it's a large sovereign wealth fund and the CIO has changed and they want to get a new portfolio. Um, maybe it's a high net worth family office that has decided that it is not worth the time to remain invested in the fund that only has one deal left. So there are many different ways. And so Grosvenor has teams of professionals that focus on secondaries, co-investments, and primaries, and they work collaboratively together. And that's what uh, the private equity trust has access to. Um, if you look at um, the returns on the page, Russ had mentioned Burgess, which is one of the large third-party kind of industry benchmarks. What you'll notice is that not all private equity is equal. So if someone came to you and said, we can get you into a private equity fund, that might be a great opportunity, but it might also be a poor opportunity. Um, if you compare this to public listed equities, uh, the dispersion between the different quartiles of returns amongst managers is much broader. So you can see in North America over the last 10 and almost 15 years that the difference between an upper quartile manager and a median manager is almost 10%. Um, and so what Grosvenor really aims to do is we have a lot of boots on the ground and a lot of relationships over many years to get access, as Russ mentioned, to those um, hard to access upper quartile managers. And if um, our returns, you know, look like more that upper quartile profile over a long period of time. For the trust, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to deliver a long-term private equity portfolio through the cycle. We didn't want to make a bet on any single company or any single manager, nor any single geography or sub-strategy. And so what you'll see here is that we use three main uh, ways to diversify the portfolio. Um, first, vintage year. So this is when we invest in funds. Um, it's impossible to time the private equity market, especially, as I said, since when we commit capital to a primary fund, you don't really know exactly when over that three to five year period they're going to deploy their capital. And so what you want to do is you want to constantly be layering in your capital to different vintages. Um, we also use secondaries as a way to diversify backwards. So you could actually go to the market today and you could buy private equity funds that had a 1995 vintage that have one deal left in it. Maybe it's a 2015 vintage, um, or maybe it's an unfunded current vintage. And so you have a lot of flexibility to use secondaries to diversify backwards and forwards. And then co-investments are single deals that are a point in time transaction. So there we can really tell to make sure we're not overexposed to the economic cycle at any point. We can basically make those co-investments over time. From a geographical standpoint, Grosvenor really focuses on North America. So today we're 70% North America, 20% um, Europe, and 10% rest of the world. Over time, we're, we will be flexible with those allocations. We have offices all around the world. We've got Japan, Hong Kong, Seoul, London. Um, and so as we continue to see opportunities in more developed managers um, with robust investment as well as operational capabilities, I think that pie chart will start to become more balanced. But today, this is a more focused North American approach, and we have a lot of boots on the ground. And one of the ways that we are one of the leaders in the small emerging manager practice is that we have investment professionals not only in major cities like Chicago and New York, but also in secondary and tertiary U.S. or North American cities who are developing relationships with those managers. And it, that's critical because, as Russ said, when they open their doors for their next fund, if they're an upper quartile manager, um, they really have excess demand. And so they get to pick which investors they want to align with. And so Grosvenor's relationship is critical to getting access to that portfolio. And that's something that we can offer the PU1 investor. Lastly, we really focus on buyouts as the strategy. This is really the core to private equity. Um, we do do some special situations, which looks more like distress, um, as well as some growth equity, but that's really a minority compared to the buyouts. You'll notice, as Russ said, we don't do venture capital because we think that it's um, a pretty small universe and that there are a handful of upper quartile managers that have tremendous excess amount of capital at their disposal. And so the dispersion there, if you can't get into those, is very big. And so we stay away for now. 
Um, if you look at our goal over time as we get to the long-term target allocation, we really want to be balanced between the different implementation styles of private equity. So co-investments, which again are single deals, primaries, which are funds, and secondaries, which are those used funds, as well as an opportunistic private equity approach, and then a small sleeve of private credit, which we think has a nice complementary attribute of cash flow and yield to help support the dividend, um, as well as some stability. What you'll notice is that as we've modeled um, over the life of the next 10 years, we think that the fund will have access to almost 90 underlying funds and then almost over 500 underlying companies. Um, that will vary over time depending on where um, we actually invest, but that is a rough projection and shows the high level of diversification of the portfolio. So again, you're not betting on any single fund manager, any geography, or any specific deal. Um, what you will also notice is that, again, we want to be very balanced between the different allocations, but it's going to be a highly dynamic portfolio. If you look at the next slide, um, the first bar chart on the left shows you where we project to be at the end of our first year, which is pretty predictable at this point. Um, we have been able to really get invested in private equity pretty quickly. Um, using some of Grosvenor's um, semi-seeded funds. And so we have two um, funds, which are our co-investment fund, as well as our opportunistic fund, which started making investments back in 2018. And the Pangana Trust was able to come into later closes and get their pro rata share of those investments. So today the opportunistic um, has over 20 deals in it and the co-investment has over 11 private equity deals. We also, as you see, have a large gray bar there, which is our short duration credit. Um, this is really what we're using as the funding vehicle or the bank. So rather than keeping cash just in the bank where interest rates are very low, we thought that we could leverage Grosvenor's expertise in credit where we've invested over $14 billion across the enterprise and really use some of our key relationships such as PIMCO and TCW to develop an account that would allow us to fund um, the private equity commitments as the capital was called, but also return in excess of what you would get in a bank account. Um, our first focus is really having access to that money and the protection of that capital, and then the return being secondary. So we've conservatively only estimated those accounts for earning low single digit type returns. However, in the last year, the returns have been much greater than that based on what um, bond yields have done over time. And what you'll notice later is that over 80% of those um, underlying credit investments are actually in investment grade credit, which again speaks to the risk tolerance. Um, what you'll notice over time is that we've said over a three to four year period, we expect to work towards our target portfolio. Um, which again will be relatively balanced between the different styles of private equity with a small private credit allocation. Um, and we think that we've tested out when we decided the size of this raise, um, we wanted to make sure that we would still be able to deliver on that three to four year time frame. And so we're highly confident that we can do that um, even if we hit the max of the current raise. Um, Maybe as a last thing, and then we'll stop for some questions, um, this is a, shows what's in the portfolio today. So as Russ mentioned earlier, um, when we came to market, obviously we were describing our platform and what we do, but it was an unproven product and it was unclear the types of managers and the speed of which we could commit that capital. And so um, I think we've done a nice job uh, giving access to some really top private equity managers as well as deals. Um, and on this page, you can see a handful of them. Um, names that are both in that small and emerging kind of core practice where leverage levels are lower typically in the companies and valuation multiples are lower um, and real sector expertise, but also some larger managers. And so um, quickly, I'll just mention a few of them. Vista, which is probably the leading software enterprise technology private equity firm based in Dallas, um, run by Robert Smith. Um, they have a tremendous ability to not only buy technology companies, but also use their consulting practice to really improve them. 
if you took all of their um, companies together, they would be the fourth largest enterprise technology company in the world. So tremendous experience, top quartile returns historically. Grosvenor was an early investor with them in Fund One, and that is why we still have access to them as they continue over time. Um, Veritas is another example, very specific expertise in the middle market um, in government technology solutions. Many of their partners have security access. Um, they're often the only sponsor bidding for some of the transactions, also a top quartile manager. And then you have someone like Carlisle, who, while it's the large kind of cap Carlisle platform, we've made a specific investment into their credit opportunities fund, where um, we're able to buy into a semi-season portfolio, making loans, um, of which is already 38% been called. Um, on the co-investment front, a lot of interesting deals. So our co-investment fund is a bundle today of 11 underlying deals. Our opportunistic fund has many more deals. Um, I'll quickly mention one, which is Cotivity. Um, this was a transaction done alongside Veritas. Um, it's a merger of a transaction which had, they had already owned, as well as Cotivity, which is focused on um, healthcare kind of payment accuracy through technology. Um, today, it's estimated that almost a third of all healthcare spending in North America is kind of excess waste and that their technology can address almost 60% of that. Um, it's been a tremendous transaction. Um, they already were two good businesses. They had about an 85% retention rate. Um, since the Veritas has taken over, they've raised that to a 95% retention rate. They've also picked up some very large contracts and cross-sold. And so that transaction, while it has only been around for two years, already has been marked up tremendously to um, over two and a half times the initial investment. Um, lastly, I'll mention Spice World, which is another good example. You know, at the current part of the cycle, while we can never time the cycle, we really want to focus on defensive businesses. Spice World was a transaction alongside of Palladium Partners. Um, Grosvenor had been invested in previous Palladium Partner funds, but had not made a commitment to the future one, but still was offered this opportunity. Um, Spice World is one of the leading garlic manufacturers, um, has over a 50% market share in North America um, in the retail channel, which is very high margin and has good protection against uh, Chinese production. Um, they have very long-standing relationships with both the garlic farmers as well as with the retail firms. And um, it was a family-owned business, which uh, Palladium came in and wanted to bring some professionalism to it. They have changed out the management team, made some cost changes, and it's a transaction we're very excited with and, again, has a very stable demand profile even through kind of rougher market cycles. So those are two examples of just co-investments. There's many more on here as well as opportunistic deals, and they'll continue to add up over time. Um, and we're very excited about the portfolio, how it's developed, and uh, look forward to gaining more capital to put to work um, that will flow through the Grosvenor system alongside all the other capital we're always doing. So, Thanks, Sean. Uh, we'll uh, now... Um go to answering some questions and uh, apologies first up if we don't get to any of your questions but always happy uh, at Pengana to take a call from you and to um, answer your uh, questions uh, directly. The first question we have is about um, explain that your hedging policy. Um, our, uh, uh, our P1 is specifically an unhedged vehicle so we carry uh, predominantly US dollar exposure and the reason why specifically uh, we've done this is because it reduces the volatility or the risk of the portfolio. So I'll give you a hypothetical uh, example. If we woke up uh, tomorrow morning and equity markets had crashed, um, I say the equity markets were down 30%, and the Aussie dollar um, is almost certainly, in our view, likely to crash with the marketplace. So the Aussie dollar might be down 20 or 25 percent. Um, what that would mean for the NAV uh, or the net asset value of the portfolio is the NAV of the portfolio would kick up 
because it's unhedged. So it would go up 20 or 25, 25 percent. And uh, so at that point in time, it's um, um, surely possible, or some would say likely, that in that type of marketplace, that a discount to NAV uh, might open up. Um, but uh, our NAV would have kicked up a lot, um, so we are effectively hedged against that type of scenario. So we do well, at least on a book value basis, uh, in a market crash uh, type, type scenario. Uh, there's obviously no free lunch. Uh, so uh, in a world where the Aussie dollar is increasing, uh, then we would give up uh, value or give up uh, returns. Um, we, um, but we think that that's a good trade-off because in such a scenario, uh, the Aussie dollar is likely to strengthen in a, in a world that's going pretty well where there's probably synchronized global growth. And under those uh, circumstances, the underlying portfolio should be doing really well. Um, our investors, other portfolios, uh, would be doing uh, would be doing uh, really well um, uh, too. Uh, so, so we think that that's a good trade-off. And as as I say, it uh, reduces the riskiness um, of of the portfolio. The second question I have is, um, uh, why do you trade at a premium? And is that sustainable? Uh, so this is uh, this is a good question. Um, in our view, uh, we think that we deserve uh, to trade uh, deserve to trade at at the premium. Um, and um, I'll address that issue maybe in the, both the short sh uh, shorter term um, and as well in the long term. Uh, so in the uh, shorter term, uh, we think that the value that Grosvenor brings to the table in terms of the access to the extremely hard to get and unique. Um, uh, sponsors as well as um, uh, co-invest deals um, is extremely valuable, and that should be reflected uh, in the um, the value of the of the, of the vehicle. Uh, so, if you think about it um, in really simple terms, uh, if uh, our access uh, to uh, to some of these really hard to access managers is such that uh, if we were able to actually take that access and to sell it. Uh, on the street this is obviously something that, that we don't do, but you take that access and sell it uh, on the street, you would actually get more than just purely the dollars that um, you um, uh, that you put into the into the vehicle. So there is a premium for that. Think of it as a as a goodwill value, um, if you like, for the for the access, and that's that's worth a substantial amount. So that's a theoretical short term phenomena. In the longer term, um, we think that um, uh, once we are able to show the market. Uh, the, um, that we have the steady 4% yield combined with very strong uh, capital growth, hopefully top quartile um, uh, growth uh, for, for the fund uh, in total, um, that uh, once we are performing at these levels uh, and the market uh, gets comfortable with that, that uh, the price of the stock will be, will be bid up uh, quite significantly because it will be such a unique not only um, uh, you know high yielding a uh, relatively high yielding asset, but also um, a high growth high, high growth asset with low uh, volatility and low correlation with equities. So we think it will warrant uh, a very meaningful uh, premium in the long term. Um, uh, ask the question about how will we manage the potential uh, discount of our share price uh, to uh, to the NAV. The uh, discount of our uh, share price, um, well, at, at the moment, uh, as we've said, we've traded a premium to NAV. Uh, the issue um, is that um, if, uh, you know, how do you, um, what can we do uh, to ensure even in difficult times that the premium uh, continues to exist or the discount um, uh, is narrow? Uh, in our view, the best way to do this um, is A, to perform uh, how we have promised our investors will perform in terms of the evolution of the net asset value uh, or the growth of the net asset value as well as the distribution yield. Uh, but also, um, it's about staying close to our investors and continuing to market to them. Um, it's a, um, a, uh, some of the vehicles in the marketplace that traded discounts to NAV, NAV in our view, uh, do not do uh, the managers do not do uh, enough in terms of getting out and seeing investors, and so that's a critical uh, uh, component of the portfolio. You can do um, undertake tasks such as capital management, for instance, going into the marketplace and buying back stock, and sometimes that can be helpful. 
But in, in our view, the most critical thing you can do is to um, uh, is to get out in markets and stay close to your investors. We also um, have the advantage of our investor base uh, being predominantly um, advised clients, so it's mostly through financial advisors. And the financial advisors are great to have as, uh, as investors because they're long-term holders, they understand the value um, of, the, um, of the investment in a portfolio construction uh, perspective and um, do not uh, sell out just because markets get rocky, et cetera, and actually understand that, that at a time of um, rocky markets, this investment um, is potentially um, hugely valuable in, in their portfolios. Um, I think um, we, uh, we've asked if we can provide a, a, a copy of the slides. You, you certainly will see um, a, a copy of the slides um, and they will be available um, in some format um, on our um, uh, on our website or alternatively um, contact us and please we'd be happy to provide them for you. Um, I might just stop there. Um, we've run out of time. Thank you everybody for your um, for your attendance and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free uh, to contact any member of the Pangana team with additional questions and once again my apologies if we didn't get to answer your question on the um, on the webinar. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.